Chris are in an extraordinary position of being able to believe three impossible things before breakfast. I'm a, bi I'm a biologist and I don't. But I also wanted to say one other thing, uh, um, which as it were reflects on what Nigella was saying, and that is that we are very much affected by the culture in which we grew up. And um, a, a Jewish atheist isn't quite the same as a Christian atheist because the God we don't believe in is different from the God that Christians or Muslims don't believe in. <laughs> I think it's different. But, uh, sorry, going back to something that our philosopher friend said, surely by definition itself, an atheist has to have a God not to believe in. What, what do you believe in yourself? Well, personally, I, I was brought up a Christian. I'm now head of religious studies at a boys' school. And personally, for me, it makes, it makes no sense to say I do not believe in a God. I, I, that, that phrase in itself does not make sense for me. Yes, but that's because you put the question the wrong way round. I mean, the point is, why do you feel you need to believe in something outside the existence of yourself as a person, the world in which you see and the world in which you observe? Well, why do we all feel the... the it just seems to be a trait of human nature to feel that we ah. need to. Mm. Ah, you mean that there's a biologist, I can explain why you believe in God, whereas a believer, you can't explain why I don't believe in God. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I once heard um, a Buddhist monk say that in order to be a really good Buddhist monk, you have to be a little bit not Buddhist. And I was rather interested by that, because I think in order to be a good Christian, there have to be little areas of, of doubt and blind spots and areas where you want something to break in and reveal something rather new and exciting to you. And I wonder if, as an atheist, you think that to be a good atheist, there have to be little areas of not being a good atheist. Are there areas in which some kind of doubt or revelation might creep in, whether it's outside your paradigm or something entirely shocking? Stephen? Well, I actually think that's a very interesting question, um, because it's possible to live with doubt. It's possible to live as a scientist with not knowing the answers to certain sorts of questions. It seems to me that religious people find it very difficult to, to live without doubt. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also the case that um, it's easy to understand why people feel religion, feel the need to believe in some afterlife, feel, as it were, a cry of pain in an unjust world, all the reasons why people need to feel some sort of sense of security. So I can be an atheist and not feel the need to believe in those things, but I can be very sympathetic with some of the people in this audience who do believe in those things. Luda, do you regard it all as superstition, Luda? Well, what I think uh, people forget is that all gods in history, and there have been thousands and thousands and thousands, and the ones we're talking about is just the latest god, they have all been invented by human beings. How did you think they got here? They're all human constructs. And so, uh, why should I believe in somebody else's God? Uh, do you accept Ludo's interpretation of that, that that means that we're inventing them? Well, I think you could certainly say that lots of atheists would like to say that the Our Father just began our projection who art endemic. But the reality is that even if it's just a projection, our paradigms are still paradigms. Our interpretations, whether psychological or philosophical, are just interpretations. But, it, surely, but surely the important thing, I think one of the things that uh, people who have a uh, great deal of faith in some supernatural being lose, I think is a faith in our human selves, that I think one can have a sense of the miraculous or the wonder of certain parts of the world and of human behavior without attributing it to a divine source. I think the problem is often we try and approach God through the intellect and I think you can't find any answers in the intellect because it's not an intellectual question, it's not to do with levels of intelligence and neither is it to do with an emotional reaction towards a loving God or an emotional reaction against a very cruel God which allows things like Rwanda and Kosovo to happen. And um, I think what we're talking about is the levels of consciousness. If, if, can I understand you correctly? If you can't approach it intellectually, are you mm. saying it's irrational? Um, what I'm saying is that um, I think the only way that we can actually have any knowledge of God, and I don't know what God is, I mean, I, all I can argue for is I do have a strong belief in some kind of spiritual realm beyond the material life that I'm living now. I don't want to know or say what God is because I can't know, but I do think there is so much evidence for things. I mean, Anthony is saying that there's no evidence for the supernatural. Now, I don't think actually anything is supernatural. We, we call things supernatural when we have no idea how to explain them, when science hasn't come up with an answer Anthony. or religion. Well, the problem is that if you leave these considerations out of the realm of uh, intellect and uh, put them into the non-rational as opposed to the irrational realm, then you have no way of controlling what kinds of beliefs you're going to admit. And on those same grounds, you could admit the existence of hobgoblins and fairies. And what you want to do is you want to have some, some disciplined and, and constrained way of thinking about the world where there, there really are better reasons for thinking one thing than for thinking another thing. I was really surprised to see such learned scholars 
and educated people sitting over there and saying that there is no God and they don't believe it. And according to Quran, the God said he has sent messengers right from the time of humanity to teach them that there is a God and they send messengers, David, Solomon, Joseph, Moses, Jesus and Muhammad to teach them in every village, in every tribe. Where else does your God exist apart from your own mind? Where else does he exist? The God is exist, uh, Mr. Kennedy, with a great respect to you because you are 10 years senior to me and God is everywhere. You tell me as that one, when you are going to leave this world. All I'm saying to you is he doesn't exist in my mind. He does exist in yours. Look, uh, it's so rare that we get an opportunity for atheists to explain what they believe and why they believe. What, what makes you tick as an atheist, Ludo? Um, all my life I've been moving in the direction of atheism because I simply from an early age couldn't subscribe to the kind of things that went on in church and having to admit I was a miserable sinner who had no health in him and had done the things he ought not to have done and, and, and uh, not done the things he should have done and all that. I felt it was demeaning and untrue. And so that's why I came to this posi position of non-belief. I mean, the creation of the world is said by Christians to be the work of God. That doesn't seem to me to take the matter any further at all. Uh, my, my view is we don't know how the world came into being. Let it remain so. Let it remain a wonderful mystery. That's, what it, that's to my mind, the importance of the thing. The certainties of Christians leave me cold. Anthony. Well, I've already spoken about the problem of, of evidence and, and reason and argued that it's uh, so overwhelmingly against the supposition that there are supernatural forces. But there are other reasons too. I mean, for one thing, uh, organized religion throughout human history has been uh, such a disaster and has caused so much pain and, and suffering and uh, agony in the world. And um, organized religions also have militated so strongly against the possibility of a real morality. I mean, you know, we find our Christian leaders in this country today uh, going on about family values and adultery and this, that and the other, while there are arms factories next door exporting weapons to third world countries. And they're just not addressing the real moral questions at all. They're actually getting in the way of it. Nigella. Well, in a way, I find it very hard to explain why an atheist, because in a sense, it seems to me so much the rational position to take. It's, 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 it's what I do as involuntarily as breathing that it would be very hard for me now to explain why it is. I, it's not a stance I adopt. It's, it's, I suppose in that sense, it, it, it has got something in common with, with faith, which is that it is something you, you either have or you don't have. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Well, let's just look, for example, we have there a Christian and a Muslim. If either had been born in the other's culture and religion, they would have grown up reciprocally, one as a Muslim and one as a Christian. And that says that the way we grow up and the sort of religions that we have are very much dependent on our culture, our, 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 where we've been brought up and so on. There are hundreds of religions in the world believing um, with respect a variety of incompatible things. They fight one another to the death. Um, Christians fight Muslims, Catholics fight Protestants, um, Muslims and Christians both fight Jews. Fundamentalists of all sorts of religions can believe all sorts of impossible things. Jewish men are taught to pray every day, thank God you made me not a woman. Um, Christians are supposed to believe, I understand, that when they sort of take a bit of biscuit and a glass of wine in church, that they're eating the body and the blood of Christ. These are extraordinary and grotesque superstitions. Now, it is easy for, to understand, I think, in the world of someone brought up, uh, understanding science, how, as a scientist, I can understand the world. As someone with some social and psychological understanding, I hope, I can understand why people should want to believe in something because they need something to hang on to. That doesn't mean I have to believe in it because I don't have that need. Right, let me collect some views from here. Um, I'd just like to come back to the uh, comment about organized religion and the damage it's supposedly done. I think it's important to know that where it has done so, it's done so in direct opposition to the teachings of its founder, the Jesus of the Gospels. Moreover, immense damage has arisen from an atheistic worldview. I'm thinking of Hitler, Stalin, Mao. And moreover, the activities of those people can be justified from an atheistic You're worldview. You're saying Christians have no, no monopoly of immorality. <laughs> Atheists can be immoral as, as, as well. Yes. Well, we all start from God. But uh, unfortunately, although he's supposed to be omnipotent, 
he has got a serious communication problems. Okay. So we end up with all these so-called agents and shops that sell God. And they contradict each other. I mean, God, God, if he exists, I mean, there is no need for any religion. We, we can directly communicate to him and say, what's the matter? I mean, this program, there is no need for such a program if God existed. I've uh, been a Christian all my life, and I was just wondering, has there ever been part in any of your life where you've actually believed in God or anything made you become like, non-believers? Just, just before they answer that, can I ask you, have you ever had doubts about God? Um, I've had doubts like, like sometimes in my life. And when terrible catastrophes happen, people die, sometimes huge numbers of people die, huge natural catastrophes. Do you not doubt God then? Sometimes I doubt God, but then it's things, some things bring me back to it, like I've visited the birthplace and death place of Jesus, and things when I was there, like so, unexplained things uh, uh, there. What doubts, back to it. what doubts have you had, any of you? You mean None? about being an atheist? Mm. About being an atheist? Well, no, I mean, I think the, the point about atheism is that it's a, a deliberate choice. You have to think it through. It's therefore a, a definite commitment. And as a definite commitment, you don't, you don't have doubts about it because you've thought as carefully as you can. Uh, it's interesting about the question of whether there is a God. I believe in God, but I think of it more as something that gives me a goal in life than a target, something to work towards. And I don't think it can be a bad thing, whether it can be proved or not. It's just something that, for many people, I speak for myself, but I think I speak for everyone, it gives us a goal in life and something to believe in. Isn't that, a, isn't, isn't that a fair point, Stephen? You are destroying yeah. hope for a lot of people. When people are in a corner, they like to see yeah. God as, as something they can pray to, and yeah. it can be a goal. I think that's absolutely fair. That's why I say if people need to believe in a God in order to, in order to behave in a humane way and a just way to other humans, then um, in my youth I might have been much more militant about it but I look I think that you're misguided but if it gives you a it gives you a helping hand then go for it what I'm deeply deeply opposed to is organized religion fundamentalist religion the total intolerance and mishmash of, of really bizarre beliefs that actually go along with that but if you want a personal God that helps you fine I have no problem what do you believe in oh, I'm, a, I'm a salvationist so, uh, I'm a Christian. do you accept that actually we've got a bunch of people here, all very moral beings, even though none of them believes in God? I'm sure they are very moral. The question I'd like to ask of our convinced atheists is, when you're in a tight corner, are you ever tempted to say a prayer? Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the very worst reason for having any kind of religious <laughs> scruples. Well, I have been enough. tempted to because, barter because and beg a, in my past, yeah. but not with any cowardice. sense of, it's I mean, of just... Well, spiritual cowardice, isn't it? It, it happens, but it's spiritual cowardice. No, no, I'm not saying that it happens. When it does, it's spiritual cowardice. It's, it's uh, evidence of the fact that um, Jung is right about why um, people have religious beliefs. They want a kind of archetype of the father figure, somebody to keep them safe in the universe and look after them. I just wanted really to uh, pick on the point that it was the uh, family background that makes a difference. Um, I'm a born-again Christian and became, um, had a fairly dramatic spiritual conversion about five years ago. Um, and my family um, are not religious people. I didn't particularly want to go to church. I didn't particularly want to become a Christian. Um, but I'm here really to say that it's possible to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. And that's what I have on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but hang, you, hang, you, hang on. No, no yeah. Nick, I, I want to ask him what, one, one thing. Why didn't you have a spiritual conversion to Mohammedanism, to Judaism, to, to, to becoming a Mooney, to becoming a Scientologist? Why choose to become a born-again Christian? And granted that people can have spiritual conversions to these other faiths, what's so special about yours compared with the others? Well, I, I didn't choose. I, as I say, I had a, a spiritual conversion. I didn't choose a particular religion. Um, it chose you. It chose you me. Mean people around persuaded you. Well, no, I, I had a spiritual experience where I believe um, the, the Holy Spirit entered my life. Now, if, you, if you lived in Tehran, right. do you think that you'd have become a born-again Christian, or do you think you'd have become a born-again Muslim? A born-again Christian. Mm. Yes, indeed, please. Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, Stephen's got a certain point that culture has a relevance in our beliefs. I think he's being a little bit strong in so, in so vociferous opinions that he's presenting to us, in suggesting to us that he's above an influence of the culture. And Stephen wouldn't be an atheist if he was born in one of the many other areas where very intelligent people believe there was evidence for God. And that's the key issue. And I think Anthony's right. The, uh, one key issue is, is there evidence for God? Anthony says the evidence is overwhelmingly against God. I would disagree with that. I would say that the evidence, particularly from modern science, is overwhelmingly in favor of God. All these people have used mathematics, for instance, to show how 
the world is interlinked. So they've shown us how, for instance, uh, a butterfly in South America can affect the, we the weather patterns here in London. They've shown us how events millions of years ago at the beginning of evolution have determined the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in this studio today. They've shown that everything is linked together and rather like, to resurrect an old argument, rather like a watch, when you see that everything is linked together in balance very clearly as a unity, you say, well, there must be an explanation. But actually, the way that you've described the processes of evolution yourself are precisely the ways in which we do not need a designer. You said that we need to explain something, there must be a reason. An explanation does not demand a supernatural reason. An explanation demands a logical account of how we can have got from here to there. You know, maybe he, he can avoid the word supernatural. Why it is we should not invoke a mind for the whole cosmos, which we know is a unity, unless he wants to deny that it all fits together as one thing. Why we should not go beyond the universe, go beyond the natural world for an explanation, in the same way as we do for a human artifact, why should, a watch. Why should we, when we can have a perfectly satisfactory explanation of how watches are made by humans, and how humans have evolved, as it were, over the last four and a half billion years without that? You're demanding that we have something on top of that. I'm saying there is no need for it. What I'm saying is that we're now in a position, because of modern science, because it's shown sort of that the universe yes. is a unity, and maybe Stephen can tell us whether he believes the universe does fit together. Everything has a place and a purpose within the whole of the cosmos. But isn't that just a matter of definition? <laughs> uh, this has a unity no, at the moment. This microphone is part of my hand and part of my arm. But, but you know, if I take it away, it isn't anymore. It just depends how you define things, doesn't it? Well, uh, no, it's a little bit more than that, because it is defined, and because of that, my voice is being broadcast over airwaves very successfully, and you know it is. It works. The mathematics is true. It, it's successful. It's telling us something now, true supposing, about the way... Now, supposing that, somebody came along and actually explained to your satisfaction how the universe, assuming it did need a beginning, how it began, how life began the worst... Supposing that could be done by hmm. science, would you still believe in God? Well, uh, my question would be, is this argument within the system, in which case, in what sense does it explain something which holds together... Uh, which has lots of parts which hold together as one thing. If the explanation is within the system, in what sense is it an Ludovic, explanation? Ludovic. Well, I want, I'd like to ask you one question, and that is, you would agree that God is an immaterial being? Yes. How did an immaterial being create a material universe? Well, uh, how, I believe that my mind is immaterial. I believe I'm free. I believe it's more than matter. I'm not therefore, asking about you. Not I'm not okay, asking about you and your watch. mind. I'm well, asking about God. Okay. When a mind thinks of something, it is possible for it to exist. And God is the ultimate mind. Just like when my mind thinks of a microphone, we can make something new, a microphone, not part of nature. It wasn't there before. When God's mind thinks of something mathematically as one thing, it exists because he is the so ultimate being. So you're saying we're a figment in God's imagination? No, not a figment, because when God knows something, it exists. That, so it, we are real. We are real. And are, maybe we this can... is a vital difference, you know, between believers and non-believers, which is believers need to have uh, a sense of reason, uh, not reason, but it's kind of an excuse for an explanation and justice, whereas in a way, if you're a non-believer, you're, uh, you're able to accept the randomness of the universe. Okay, well, let, let, let me, let me bring it right, very, very quickly. Quick I need God as a plant needs the sunshine. It doesn't mean the sun doesn't exist because the plant needs the sunshine. It's quite the opposite. It means that he does exist. Uh, you mentioned just now morality. I'd just like to ask on what basis uh, the panel would distinguish between right and wrong. How, can I ask how you distinguish between right and wrong? Uh, my personal Christian faith. Um, I'd say that would be dependent on my experience daily in terms of prayer and listening to God and in terms of uh, reading the scriptures. But there must be every day circumstances you come across where you have to make a moral decision. You don't pray for each one. No, I mean, it also comes within the framework of my upbringing, which is Christian. Um, but I think as well it's always um, informed at its basis uh, by my faith. And do you suspect that atheists aren't as moral as you are? Um, I suspect that the end result of atheism, say it became spread around and people uh, mo moved into it, I think it would in the end result in anarchy and chaos. That's Anthony. very patronizing if I may say so. <laughs> Anthony. I, mean, the, I think the, the essential point here is that uh, there would be probably rather little difference between the moral outlook of an atheist and a, 
and affairs to one kind or, or another if what they were agreeing on was the need for concern for, for, for others, taking their interests and needs into account, trying to adjust the way one behaves towards them sensitively and responsibly. But what we differ about is the ground for doing this. The atheist would say that we do these things out of respect for other human beings and from, on the basis of an understanding of the vulnerability and frailty of, of human life, our own experience too. Whereas the, the theist is going to say, if you don't do it, you fry. That is the ultimate sanction of and religious also, morality. I would like to say as well that I think that you could argue the other way around. You could argue that a believer who needs this structure imposed, as it were, supernaturally or from a divine source is a person who doesn't know within himself or herself how to tell right from wrong and needs this code. And it's quite interesting, there's some work done by the uh, psychologist Dorothy Rowe who found that there was, a, there, were, there was a disproportionately high number of Catholics in prison. And part of this is because it is, it, you could argue, and I wish, wish by this to cause no offence, that it is a religion which codifies uh, good behaviour, bad behaviour very strongly and leaves people not much room. Yes, and, and it doesn't need people a lot of could be related to a lot of things, including poverty, social declaration, yeah. all sorts of other yeah. things as well, of course. Yeah. I do concur that we must seek the truth with reason. That's clear. Otherwise, we're open to the, the hobgoblins. So, so you don't believe that God is above rationality? Um, it, it's clear that God created our reason and is quite happy that we should seek him. If we turn to the human experience, we know from that experience that we are free, free to make decisions, for example. We know from science that the laws of nature control all physical bodies. So since we are free, we must be more than just a physical body. We, we have a soul, a spiritual nature. As atheists, I'm very interested to, to know, how do you account for the soul? I'm not sure what you mean by a soul, but, uh, but that's a classical Cartesian view. There is material stuff in the world, and there's some spiritual stuff out there. I'm thoroughly a materialist. Um, I believe that there are things like money and football grounds and the rules of football and the rules of law and parliament in the world which are rules give, given by the social order in which we live and therefore not forces and all those forces which are there. But in that sense we are free because we are at the interface of many determinisms. Anthony? Well one terminus of the, of the old, the hoary old problem you raised there about freedom and determinism uh, is to point out that our being part of a causal realm of natural law is not in conflict with our being free moral agents. Because what would be opposed to our freedom as moral agents would be constraint. If somebody points a gun at your head and says, do so and so, then you're constrained and you don't have much choice. But just being part of the causal realm actually is important because otherwise what you do, the consequences of your actions, wouldn't truly be yours, so you couldn't be praised or blamed for them. Yes, I'm an agnostic myself and uh, I just think that um, there's a possibility that everything is out there. There's a possibility there's a God, there's a possibility there isn't. So um, couldn't you open your mind just slightly just to see if there was like any kind of possibility there actually is a God? So there's nothing to prove that there is and there's nothing to prove that there isn't. Well, you've heard the saying, haven't you, that if you have a, a very uh, too open mind, your brains fall out. And that's what happens in this case too, because if you're that kind of open to possibilities, then you might as well be open to hobgoblins and fairies. The point is that your thinking about what kind of place the world is must be disciplined. You must you must apply reason to the evidence and try to think what really is plausible and stable by way of an hypothesis about the world. But more and more people are open to hobgoblins and fairies now and that is actually quite interesting that the yeah. sort of new age thing and belief in anything uh, if, if something can't explain it, it's somehow seen now as proof that it exists and of course one can't really debate mm. that point. I'd just like to ask were your decisions to become atheists specifically um, as a result of particular religious obligations. I was brought up, I suppose I was brought up an atheist. And I'd also like to ask how you bring your children up, as, will you bring them up as atheists as well? Well actually I do, and, but I try not, I, because I don't want them to turn into fundamentalists, I try not to be too vociferous, bearing in mind that children do react to their parents often. So for example, when my uh, daughter, who's five, learns at school about God or something, I say, but you do understand that not everyone believes in God and I don't. Or that, you know, these are beautiful stories, but they are just stories. How would you react if your children did become Orthodox Jews? With horror. Uh, I Orthodox, I, I mean fundamentalist anything. I make no distinction, by the way. Sure. I've on several, on several occasions have uh, seen the light, experienced the love, and from that end of total belief, uh, I went to uh, being an atheist. Uh, and in both situations, I found that when I was completely confused and down uh, right at the bottom, 
He was there. He was there to comfort me. And you know, uh, the belief of God, of light, is common to all religions. What interests me, you talk about how much comfort there is from believing in God. Um, let me ask some of people who do believe in God, how you justify that, the sense that God is good and all-powerful, with how many desperately appalling things happen in the world. Because if God can see everything, knows everything, surely he's responsible for everything. So how do you answer that? I'd say that the most appalling thing that could happen to anyone is to die without God. And uh, in that case, whatever happens... So getting crushed in an earthquake is... It's terrible, but it's over within a short period of time. Whereas to well, spend What about people who, who, who are trapped for maybe a week or two before they die? In, in what we call a natural disaster, some people yeah. call them, you know... I think of... everyone here who's a Christian would feel the same. I think everyone here has cried you, you, over something. And you don't blame God for that? I don't blame God for it. Why, if um, he's all-knowing and all-powerful, firstly, he knew it was going to happen before it happened, and being all-powerful, he could have prevented it. I think in the first place, most tragic things that happen come down to our own sin can use that word, wow. that's great. Uh, the things that we do, and I think also that in the end there is complete justice. We don't understand justice, but God does, and all of us will have to face God one day. Uh, what intrigues me as far as, as far as the four of you are concerned is how beleaguered you are. We haven't packed this audience. I think this is reasonably representative. Do you feel beleaguered? Do you feel that you're holding what is a very difficult minority view. Well, there are many more of them than there are of us. So. Yeah. That's certainly true. But I feel, in a sense, I feel uh, not so much beleaguered because, you know, uh, you know, I don't take this personally. But nevertheless, I find it extraordinary because it seems to me there is such a gulf between the two positions that a debate is very difficult because it's impossible, I would have thought, for, for us to to argue on those grounds, that if God exists, he wants this and he wants that, he doesn't want that, this is his... It's, it's not a way that no, one can have a conversation. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't mean do you feel beleaguered here in this studio, but just in life, generally, there is so much acceptance in so many areas that, that God in some form exists, that if you don't believe it, do you feel that your position is poorly represented? Do you feel that it, it's misunderstood, or no, do you feel was, cool about what, it? What you're suggesting is happening less and less. People are leaving the churches in droves and have been for a long time and are continuing to do so. So the, the onus is on them to go on showing that uh, it's a wonderful world and God is alive and in his heaven and all's well with the world and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's just that is falling on stony ground now, that message. And people are not believing it anymore. Uh, these people are part. And another thing, Dick, if I may say so, <coughs> one or two people have talked about spirituality. But I never thought that the church had a monopoly of spirituality. Do uh, you remember Walter Savage Landor wrote a poem before he died? I strove with none, for none was worth my strife. Nature I loved, and next to nature art. I warm both hands before the fire of life. It sinks, and I am ready to depart. Nature and art, nothing about religion. And I've had more spirituality in my life from nature and from art. Uh, than, than almost any other thing. I remember in the war, <coughs> being in the destroyer on the summer evenings, when the sea was calm and there was no sound except just the swish of the bows going through the water, and the stars were in their thousands up there, and uh, I had an extraordinary feeling that I and the stars and the sea and the sky were one and indivisible, but God didn't enter into that equation. It was just a feeling I had. Anthony. The fact is that if you look at, at Christian morality, or if you look, if you examine carefully any of the theistic uh, revealed moralities, you find that insofar as they, they're good, they share their good points with most serious and reflective moralities, and insofar as they are bad, it, it jars with our sensibility. And I find that uh, religion today, Christianity today, presents itself as a very loving and caring uh, religion. You only have to go and look at the way it presented itself in medieval times with these violent images of, of uh, cruelty and torture and suffering on the cross and the uh, St. Catherine being broken on the wheel and all these ghastly things in order to frighten people into paying their tithes to the priest. And if you know your history, you know that religion throughout most of its history has not been a kindly force. Stephen Ludovic gave us an almost poetic reason yes. for not believing in God in, in, in his view. Um, do you feel that sense of, of oneness with the nature that you don't need God? In a sense I do, and in a sense as a scientist I would like to, 
Um, what I resent about religion is, particularly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, its belief in humanity's power, right to dominate the rest of nature, and that's a head tradition that science has inherited from its Judeo-Christian roots. I think we do need to look at some of the new religions and the Eastern religions, which are actually have a much closer sense of the unity of humanity and, and God. But you asked originally, do we feel beleaguered? I mean, I, I have to confess that this audience apart, I know almost no one who actually sort of would regard the question of God as even relevant. I mean, in a sense, we live in an increasingly secular society. Such people as, as are religious are increasingly, as others have said, not religious in the Orthodox Christian or Jewish or any other sort of sense, but a are, 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 are moving after very strange sets so of you, beliefs. So you, as it were, feel you're winning the argument. Nigella, do you think atheism is winning the argument? I, I feel that in a way there isn't an argument and that the two sides aren't talking generally, you know, outside of this. But I have to say I do feel, perhaps if there's anything that mystifies me, it is this, it is the willingness with which people want to give themselves up to, to superstition and I find that strange. Well, if we didn't have religion, what on earth would we have to argue about? Well, um, quite a lot, actually. Um, see you for the next program. Tomorrow, complimentary medicine. Claire Rayner and Dr. Mark Porter give their views at usual time, 20 past five.